Babies communicate life and hope. A new generation to be carriers of the gospel message. The story of Jesus Christ to the world that desperately needs it. May we covenant as a church to take these young children, make them disciples who glorify God by loving Him and loving others. Last week, if you were not able to be with us, our shepherds passed out a book by Dr. Craig Hood entitled, Take God at His Word. And what we're asking is for our congregation to spend, oh, about 15, 20 minutes at the most, reading through a chapter a week as we uh, prepare and, and begin a conversation. So if you weren't here last week, these are available down in the office area. Please take one per family unit. And next week, uh, we will discuss chapter two. So go ahead and read chapter one and chapter two. Well, over the, the next few days, kids in grade schools across this country are going to be taking shoe boxes and decorating them in preparation for Valentine's Day on Thursday. Do you remember doing this when you were in school? And, and in addition to, to decorating your box and getting ready, you had to get your mom or dad to take you down to the grocery store. And I, I remember back in the day, these Valentines were all handmade, but in, in my generation, we went to the grocery store and, and bought a box a collection designed uh, to be passed out at school. And it, it was pretty neat because, well, I didn't think it was all that neat, but in our school, our teachers required that you give a valentine to each and every student in your class. Uh, you couldn't leave anyone out. You had to give something to everybody. You were compelled to give. Now, I didn't like this. For one thing, it meant that I was required to give a card that says, be my valentine to the guy that continually pegged me in dodgeball. He was basically a jerk to everyone during recess. I had to ask him to be my valentine. And, and the reason that I did this is because I had to. I didn't want him to be my valentine. In fact, I wanted an eighth grader to beat him up while I watched. But I was compelled to do this. Now, the, the other guys in my class, my, my buddies, I, I guess I gave them a valentine because I thought that I ought to. And so I would kind of sift through the box and kind of pick, well, the manliest valentines I could of either a matchbox car, maybe a Tonka truck or basketball or something. And, and so, and, and I would, you know, write something, you know, a deep gruff voice, you know, be my valentine dude, but not in a weird way. And, and so you, you kind of pass these out. But there was always one or two cute girls in, in class, or girls, you know, maybe it was a guy, and, and uh, you know, you didn't have to be compelled to give at all, and in fact, you were pretty excited about sending this whole Valentine. And I, I remember the time, of, approximately, when I started noticing girls, this is around the fourth grade, maybe I was a late bloomer, but I, I remember that time because when they, they posted the, the class roles up on the front door, and this is back for emails, so you had to actually go up to the school and, and see, you know, what class you're in. I remember riding my bike with my buddy Brian up there, and, and we started looking. We weren't looking for the first time as to who our teacher was. That was irrelevant. We were wanting to know what girls were going to be in our homeroom. And I remember my finger going down, and right above my name was C.C. Cooper. And I remember kind of saying under my breath, well, hello, C.C. You're going to be in my class. And you know, when, when Valentine's Day rolled around, uh, I was kind of like Charlie Brown, you know, with the little red-headed girl. You remember that cartoon strip? And, uh, and, and I was smitten. And so when, when it was time, you didn't have to guilt me into giving her something. In fact, Cece was the first one that I wrote out my Valentine's to. I laid them all out and picked my favorite and gave it to her. In fact, I even stuck in a piece of double mint gum so she'd have fresh breath. But as a kid, I remember going through this process. And if someone was pressuring you into giving, it just didn't feel good. Remember that? And we may give something to someone, you know, to that person but because we're, we're, we're forced to, but it doesn't change our opinion of them, and it doesn't change our heart. It didn't make me have, have warm feelings toward the guy that was pegging me with the ball. But and it certainly didn't cause me to want to be more generous. So as we start this, this three-week series on stewardship and giving, I'm, I want you to know up front that I'm not going to teach you that you have to give. And I'm not going to be sending us all on a guilt trip because I think it's counterproductive. 
counterproductive to what I'd like to communicate. And to me, it misses the whole point. What I want us to do over the next few weeks instead is to have a conversation. And a conversation based on, on God's Word and some of the teachings. Because as we start talking about some of these principles, I want you to know that money is important to us. And money is also important to God. So we will begin this discussion this morning. And I want us to talk about the different motivations for giving. Different motivations for giving. Because I think it's important not only that, that we get ready to do this, but also that we examine our heart and see what's going on there when we write a check to the church. So have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll be beginning in verse 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, we, we've got to start somewhere. And from this passage, it appears that the first motivation that is out there, uh, at, at some level or not, is guilt. What I call have-to giving. If anyone has uh, a, a friend or family member, how many of you have someone that is kind of a master at getting things done through the motivation of guilt? They have a way of just pressing your mother. Maybe it's a mother, maybe it's a mother-in-law, maybe it's the head of the PTA. Just knows exactly what to say to, to make you do something you don't want to do. So this is kind of a, a base level of motivation. And the strength of this motivation is it can be effective. It can cause you to do something you normally wouldn't do or make the choice to do. So that, that's the strength. But the weakness in the motivation, why I say it's the lowest, is it's joyless. There is not a, a warm feeling that comes over when we're compelled to do this. And if we're talking about giving, it doesn't help us to, to outgrow some of our struggles with materialism and, and some of the decisions that we make with our finances. So if we are guilted in or we have to give, it's not helping us to grow in our discipleship walk. So there's no... There's no joy in being forced to give. And in reality, it's like taxation. I mean, I'm sure that there are some people when April 15th rolls around are excited and, and get a warm fuzzy when they write that check to Uncle Sam. But most of us are not. And, and you know, you can be arm twisted into giving to the church, but that doesn't help you to become more godly, to work on your heart. Okay, what if we were to say you don't have to but you should contribute. Okay, well that takes us to motivation number two. And that's responsibility or ought to giving. Is that, is that a little better? I mean, does that kind of make you, man, I, I don't know, just kind of feel a little bit warmer? Now, I'm not being forced to, but I'm being challenged to step up and to do the right thing. And certainly there, there's some passages in Scripture that kind of lean us in this direction. They kind of have this tone about giving. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 18 says, As for the rich in this present age, which by the way is all of us, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides for us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Well, What's kind of the, the strengths of this ought to giving? One of the strengths is we can feel good about doing our duty. So we, we have been presented with this and encouraged in this direction. And so when we fulfill it, well, we're doing our duty. The weakness is it tends to lean towards kind of a legalistic act. And, and a lot of times it, it prompts a response of, okay, well, what's the bare minimum to kind of get you off my back if I'm supposed to be doing this? Kind of where, what, what's a baseline that you'll be satisfied and I'll be satisfied with? But what it, what it feels even better than this ought to giving is when you want to give, right? Giving because you ought to sometimes doesn't feel that good, but man, if it's something where you want to give, well, that, that feels a lot better to our heart. Motivation number three, which is what I call needs based or want to giving, it, it does give you that warm feeling. And, you know, like I mentioned, when you have that, that girl or that guy that you have a crush on, you want to give that valentine to, you know, you're excited about doing that. 
And sometimes in a church context, when a clear need is presented, and, and a case is made, and is thrown out to the congregation, these are the things that you step up with, and it makes you want to grab your wallet. Because the, our, our congregation is fantastic about this. Let me give you a quick example. Last year, when, when we talked about buying a disaster relief trailer, uh, and, and we had some funds that were generated for, from the golf tournament, we were able to purchase that, and there was an excitement after what happened in our community and, and across the southeast with the tornadoes coming through. We wanted to be on the front lines for that. But a need was communicated that we have these trailers, but they're not outfitted on the inside. So this congregation stepped up and purchased the chainsaws and the chaps and the generators and the tarps, all the things to outfit this. Because not only do we believe in the guys that be going out by stepping up and helping financially, it was like we were along the, the, the route with them as a part of this frontline ministry. So we, giving gives us connection to what's happening within the kingdom. When Art Leslie and, and Susan Calloway and their wonderful team decided to relocate the learning center to a new location, that spot was a little rough and it hadn't been occupied in a while and it needed a lot of attention. And so there was kind of this groundswell among Twickenham folks and, and others in the community to give them not only their, their time but their money and, and their talents and supplies to get that wonderful ministry up and running. So this is something we want to do. So the strengths, well, it, when we have this kind of motivation, it could be done cheerfully and completely voluntarily. It immediately helps to meet a clear need. Was there a weakness? Well, sometimes people don't agree on what these needs are or on priorities. And so someone may champion one cause while someone else champions another. And there's also the danger that if we only give to needs, everything has to kind of be packaged as, as, as a cause that, that people can, can rally around. And so we spend our time marketing that cause. And certainly not everything within the church or everything within the kingdom fits into that neat cause. And, and sometimes the, the things that need to be done don't exactly pull at the old heartstrings. And so with this is our only, only motivation for giving, some things get neglected. And the church is more than just a wholesaler of causes. The, the other problem that I see with this want to giving is, is sometimes it still puts us in the driver's seat. We're still given the ability for someone to present their case and we give a thumbs up on that or a thumbs down on that. I'm going to let someone else take care of that because that doesn't touch me like, like something else. So we're, we're still in control. And that brings us to our final motivation. Motivation number four, which is worship. It's my nature giving. And that's the attitude that, that Paul highlights a lot within his scripture, especially when he's talking about the churches in Macedonia, who despite being poor, they rally to the cause when, when Paul is taking up a collection for the starving Christians over in Jerusalem. So they're in poverty. Their lives are, are, are hanging in the balance and they don't have a whole lot of resources, but they are convinced that they need to be a part of what God's trying to do with the Christians there in Jerusalem. So let's see what, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now listen to what, what Paul says was so surprising about, about their giving. In verse 3, For I testified that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded for us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They gave like this. They said they gave themselves to the Lord. Once they give your entire body, your entire being, everything that God has, we understand that, that God has given us new life in Him, but that life is not our when, and I was able to sit on, on the friendship class, and, and Hoy talked about this, that our, our lives were bought at a price. We honor God with everything that's within our being. 
And that's what he's talking about here. They trusted God so completely, they understood God's nature and God's spirit that they gave just over and above above what Paul thought that they would give. Because it was part of their nature. And it just overflowed out of their spirit, out of what God had done within their hearts. And the great thing about this motivation for giving is there are no weaknesses, only strength. Let me identify two, and then less will be yours. Number one is this giving is meant to glorify God. Yes, it, it, it was to meet a need there in Jerusalem, but they saw it as this is my response to God, and then secondarily, I'm, I'm meeting what Paul's asking me to do here because I trust him as a man of God and trust that the resources will be used to bless others. Now, first of all, my giving is just between me and God. It's meant to glorify him and what I'm doing. Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul is still talking about this contribution. And here's what he says the effects of it are going to be when these resources arrive in Jerusalem. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. You see how it, it, it has a horizontal effect in what's happening but it's also doing something vertically. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise, not Paul, not the givers, they're going to praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in serving with them and with everyone else. When giving is just who you are because of God, it gives glory to His name. But it also, our second strength is, this kind of giving testifies to the gospel message. We talked about three years ago that as we were making plans for our capital campaign and and getting ready to to refurbish this, this auditorium, but also to commit for three years to work down in Ecuador and to begin the process of retiring off our debt. And if you were here last last week, our banker came up, handed us a note, and it was torn up. So these things were, were given. But we, we talked about that right as we're about to launch into this, and Phil God was leading us, the, the bottom dropped out on the U.S. economy. And we said, what a testimony of trust is going to be when everyone else is kind of laying low and seeing what's happening within the economy. We'll have construction trucks out here believing that God's called us to this and we're going to honor Him. And when we give, we are testifying to the truth of the gospel. We're saying we believe this wholeheartedly. There's this thing that happens when we give. That God begins to work on our hearts. And we turn this over to Him and place these gifts into His hand. It's kind of like the feeding of the 5,000. God multiplies what is given. And so His kingdom is expanded and God is honored and glorified. And the focus comes off of us and even what we're about to ministry-wise and goes upward to testify what we believe about God. Well, since we're talking about motivation, I, I feel like I need to say something uh, because you, you may wonder about what my motivation is for this series and understand that people are suspicious. Anytime a preacher is preaching about giving when, when my mortgage is covered out of the funds that are given, but my motivation is this, and the motivation of this leadership, that as we've talked about this, is that you experience God in a real way. That God begins to work on your heart as disciples. And we learn how to die to ourselves and totally turn over everything to God and live our lives in response. And God starts working on parts of our heart that maybe have been a little callous. Maybe that we've been able to step out in faith in one area, but maybe stepping back in another. God wants everything about us. So we're praying for growth on our discipleship journey. The second thing that motivates me is I want you to experience the freedom that comes from getting your finances in order. There is two things that break up most marriages, especially in the early going. And one is, is infidelity and, and stuff to go on with the sexual life. The other is finances. And so if we can begin to put our house in order according to Scripture, some of that gets pulled out. We're no longer 
a, a slave to our debtors and slave to our credit cards. And that's going to pay dividends in your peace of mind and in your marriage and all the relationships that will flow out of that if we can have that peace within our finances. Finally, my motivation is that this church realizes giving potential for the kingdom. I know that God has assembled us for a reason and God has blessed us with some very smart people, some very affluent people, some people that have been gifted in amazing ways. God has given us these talents and I want them to be rallied so that God can be glorified through what's happening through this church in the kingdom. When do you think about giving this week? And I, I hope you will. If it conjures up feelings about guilt, if it conjures up feelings about duty, or, or even conjures up feelings about your favorite cause, I pray that you'll take a step back and that you'll start having a conversation within your family having a conversation with God, asking Him to work on our hearts, and that, that God will begin a work new within us. One last thing. The valentine that God picked out for you and me communicates one thing, that He loves us and He's crazy about us. My prayer for this congregation is each one of us will respond in all aspects of our life that we're crazy about the God that loved us first.